Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jen, and I'm just so excited to be at the conference today uh, presenting this talk that we're calling Seeing the Forest Through the Trees, Product Development as Theory Building. Um, so I'll get into it in a second, but I did want to say that this is in partnership with a, a close collaborator of mine, Joe Powers, who is a staff data scientist at Intuit. So uh, I have a lot of friends who are journalists, and they always say, don't bury the lead. So I'm going to lead with today's TLDR to start with, which is that if you want to build great products, start by building great theory. And at this point in the talk, you're probably like, okay, Jen, what does this even mean? What is this theory that you're talking about? So hold your horses. It's going to become very clear as we go through this talk. And really, by the end of it, I want you to be able to do three things. First, have uh, the ability to describe what theory building really is in the context of product. Secondly, um, understand your role as a product manager uh, in the context of theory building. And then finally, obviously, I want you to walk away with some tips and tricks for becoming a better theory builder. The other thing, obviously, that I'm very excited about is hearing from all of you. So as you know, there's a Q&A that follows this. And a lot of these ideas that I'm going to present today, the goal is they're going to feel familiar. A lot of them hopefully will resonate, but from a slightly different framing than perhaps you've heard it before. And so these are new ideas that we're putting out there that we've been workshopping internally. Um, I consider this all work in progress and just couldn't be more excited to start this dialogue with you. So this is just the beginning, the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more that we could get into, but I hope that this introduces this concept that we can then talk about. All right, so before we jump into more details around theory, I just did want to say hi and introduce myself. Um, I'm Jen Wong, VP of Product at ThreadUp. I uh, have long been a fan of the women in product community, and so I'm super excited to be here today. And for those of you who may not be familiar, ThreadUp is an online marketplace for selling secondhand clothing. So up on the screen, you'll see we have our mission statement, basically, which is to inspire a new generation to think secondhand first. And the problem that really motivates us is that there are so many items of clothing that are thrown away in the U.S. each year, over 36 billion items and counting. And most of them, like over 95 percent of them, could be recycled or reused. And so the service that we really offer is that on the selling side, you can kind of get one of our clean out bags or a label that you put on a box, send in clothes that you no longer wear, and then we'll take care of everything. We're a managed marketplace. So we'll itemize, take pictures, price, all of that, put it up on our site or our app. And then if you're a buyer on the buyer side of the marketplace, you can come in and browse to find the secondhand item that you're looking for. So that's kind of our overall model. And I'll keep coming back to this um, to give illustrative examples through this talk. So the reason I'm so excited about this topic is obviously I'm now in product and we're here at this conference. Uh, but before this, I really had sort of this other history as a data scientist and as, as a social scientist studying how people make decisions and, and human behavior overall um, as part of doing my PhD in behavioral and social sciences. So for those of you who are familiar with the social sciences, a lot of these ideas um, will, will be familiar to you. There will be the, and so we're taking a lot of these ideas from this academic space and trying to see what frameworks are actually useful in product management. And so one of the key collaborators I've had in thinking through these ideas and practicing them within our own organizations is Joe Powers, my thought partner in crime. Um, but I also wanted to pause and thank all of these people who have been so invaluable in giving me feedback and having conversations around these ideas, um, including the people listed here, Annette, Johnny, Janelle, and then, of course, ThreadUp's own product and product design team. We're constantly working on our processes and trying to figure out how to make them better. And so this is really a team effort um, that we're presenting today. OK, with that, back to today's TLDR. If you want to build um, great products, start by building great theories. So how should we step into this topic? Well, let's start with a story about theory. So I'm putting up this image up front here, and I want you to think, you know, what does this bring to mind? For most of you, I'm going to guess that you probably thought about COVID, right? This mask has become the ubiquitous sign of COVID for all of us who have been through it in the last two years. And, you know, I, the reason I put this up is I actually wanted this as a reminder for everybody that 
when you think back to March 2020, we weren't wearing masks. And in fact, our leading theory around COVID was actually that it was spread by surfaces, right? And so the idea back then was that, okay, maybe it's more similar to the cold or some other infectious diseases. So if a surface was contaminated and you touched it, you potentially would be putting yourself at risk of COVID. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is that that was the leading theory of our time. And what it meant is that the interventions that were suggested, the recommendations that came down to most of us, were very reflective of this theory that we had about the transmission of COVID. So I don't need to remind too many of you, but remember back, the, back in the day, we were bringing our grocery home groceries home and wiping everything down, packages that were coming in, we were wiping down or leaving in the hallway to disinfect themselves, you know, showing up to the grocery store with gloves so that we were handling products and without, you know, being exposed to COVID. And of course, you know, the case of actually wearing gloves to the grocery store, but without a mask. Obviously, things have changed now. As time went on, we learned a lot more about COVID. And as we learned, for example, that it is probably, you know, at the time that it was more likely to be airborne um, than to be transmitted through surfaces, we evolved our theories. And as we evolved our theories, our recommendations and interventions also evolved. So up here, you'll see a tweet from the FDA basically assuring people that COVID is not transmitted through food packaging. A lot of other recommendations also came out of our evolved theory, right? So things you're all familiar with, wear a mask, distance, wash your hands. And the important thing here is that as our theories evolved, our interventions evolved, and it resulted in actual behavior change and outcomes. So we saw that most, you know, the majority of Americans started wearing masks in public. And in turn, this actually lead, led to case counts stabilizing um, as people took these actions. Okay, so I want to summarize again, the theory that we hold about what is happening fundamentally affects two things that we really care about as product managers. The first is what interventions we ultimately choose to test. And the second one is the behaviors and outcomes that those interventions affect, right? So again, this is what we care about as product people, and this is why we should be thinking about theory. So great products start by building great theories. How are we going to step into it today? I'm going to talk about three things. So what is theory? Uh, and then also, you know, how do we contrast that with hypotheses, um, which I think we spend a lot of time as a product community talking about. Secondly, how does theory actually impact product development? And then finally, what are some practices and tools for building generative theory that you could start implementing if you so choose? Let's start with what theory is. There are many, many definitions out there. There are many academic definitions, all sorts of things. Um, but for today's purposes, I'm just going to define theory as the following. It's a causal model of what drives outcomes that we care about. Now, I know you're thinking, OK, this sounds very academic. Fair. But let me hone in then on two words that really make this definition. The first word is model, right? So what do we mean by model? What we really mean is we're trying to hone in on the key variables that really matter. And the reason we need to do this is that the world is very complex and our tiny little brains can only process so much information. And so we need to simplify our understanding of the world into the key variables that matter in order to be able to wrap my, our minds around it. It's the same reason that we love frameworks so much and all of these other simplification and synthesis tools. Now, the other word that really matters in this definition is this word causal. And really, the reason it matters is that once you have your key variables identified, the causal part of it is actually understanding how these variables are related. So does one cause the other or is the direction in the other way? Are they just merely correlated? Understanding what your key variables are, how they're related, super, super important. Now, I think something that might be intimidating if this, you know, if you're thinking about this for the first time in these, in these terms is, you know, theory sounds kind of hard to build. Like, what does it mean to actually generate a causal model? And so what I wanted to say here is that we have one huge advantage helping us here, which is that humans are just insatiably theory builders. We're doing it all the time, whether or not you're aware of it or not. So let me give you an example. You show up to the office 
And this person, you know, one of your coworkers that you've never seen take a single sip of water at work has suddenly started carrying around this giant two liter gallon thing of, of water, right? So, you know, inevitably, even without me prompting you, I bet you're going to just start thinking like, huh, I wonder why, right? Is it that um, they've started a new exercise regime? Is it that, you know, maybe it's the beginning of the year and they're trying to get their eight glasses of water as a New Year's resolution? Maybe they've uh, their diet has suddenly become a lot saltier or maybe they saw this on Instagram and they thought it looked cool and they bought it, you know. So just inherently, when we see things out in the world, we start building theory. And that's essentially what theory is. It's an explanation for the phenomena that we're seeing out in the world. So you all have been doing it. You've been doing it since you were <laughs> young and you know, cogent. Um, it's something that we can take advantage of as as uh, product managers and product people. Okay, so here's a you know real life example that we've just talked about. What about in the context of product? So I'll give you an example at ThreadUp. Um, one outcome that we really care about is the price that a customer is willing to pay for an item, right? So a piece of clothing that they find on our marketplace. So if I was building a theory around this, I might think, okay, what are the main key input variables that we care about? So here are a few, you know, there is brand, what brand of the item, the item condition, uh, the discount amount that's given on that item. And then for us, you know, sustainability and like this being a more sustainable choice than if you were to buy new. So um, this I want to contrast. Um, sorry. So this is our theory overall. And then one question you might be asking is, OK, what's the difference between theory and a hypothesis? So I'll start by giving you the definition here, which is that a hypothesis is a claim that is derived from our theory that we can actually test to see whether or not it's true or false. So a theory kind of is this broad principle, the, the hypotheses derive from these theories. And so what does this look like? You know, in the example that I gave before, this is our theory about what drives customer willingness to pay. And if we were to focus just on the sustainability piece, um, if sustainability really drives willingness to pay, there are certain hypotheses that we would derive from this. So, for example, we could test adding eco -stat stats um, to our checkout page or highlighting sustainable business practices. Right. There are lots of other hypotheses that you can generate or derive from this initial theory that you have. And so ultimately what the relationship between theory and hypothesis is, is that if our theory is true, when we run these tests of our hypotheses, they should actually, we should see an increase in willingness to pay. So another way of thinking about this is that this theory causal model of what drives outcomes that we care about, it's basically these generalized principles that we can use to predict specific hypotheses. And then your hypothesis is really a claim that we expect to be true or false given what we think our theory is. All right, so that's kind of, you know, that's the, the grounding of what or how we think about theory and, and how to think about it. Now, how does this actually impact product development? Um, so to get into it, let me use ThreadUp again as an example and tell you a bit more about our marketplace. So one of the things that's really unique about ThreadUp is that we're processing a lot of secondhand items every single day, over 100,000. Each of them is unique. Um, it leads to all sorts of like unique SKU issues that I'm happy to talk about as well in another time. Um, but we also list over 35,000 brands in over 100 categories across all these price points. So if you put yourself in our shoes, um, one of the questions that we end up facing <clears throat> as a product challenge is, you know, what items should we show our customers when they return? We have 35,000 brands, hundreds of thousands of items, limited screen space. Like, what should we actually show? So the outcome that we care about oftentimes when we're thinking about this question is we want customers to actually buy an item. And now what I want you to do is you can imagine there are many different theories that could actually lead to the same outcome. And in particular, for this example today, let me talk about these two theories. One is around novelty and one is familiarity. So in the first theory around novelty, you can imagine that one reason that people come to ThreadUp is they know we have so many brands and we have so many items. And so they want to come because they want something new and different that they couldn't get if they were just to shop at a single brand like Gap or Old Navy. 
There's another theory, theory number two, which is also reasonable, but very different, which is almost the opposite, that people come to ThreadUp, but then what ultimately drives them to make a purchase is actually they're looking for something familiar to them that they know will work, right? So in that case, our 35,000 brands, super overwhelming and actually could get in the way. And so if we can kind of narrow it for them and show them things that they already know, that is what's going to increase their probability of buying an item. Now, again, as I said, two very reasonable theories. Why it matters is that the theory that you have will then affect the kind of hypotheses that you end up thinking of and ultimately end up testing. So if you think that your theory on novelty is the leading theory of what drives customers to buy an item, you might test things like, oh, let's show them new items every time they come, or let's make sure that we're showing them brands that they've never seen, right? Because they, they're here for the novelty and um, the inspiration. But if you think that familiarity is your leading theory, then you might test very different things. Like you might show them actually, instead of new items, you wanna show them uh, recently viewed items that they already engaged with. Or you wanna make sure that you're basically only showing them brands that they've shopped before. Now imagine, okay, you're a product manager. You're like, okay, let's run some tests on items. So you're gonna run two tests here. One is showing them new items. The other one is showing them items that they've recently viewed. And then you get your test results back. And what you find actually is that one of these tests actually did improve the outcome, uh, but one didn't. And so when you showed new items every time, it didn't actually move the needle. People didn't buy more. But when you showed them recently viewed items, people actually ended up buying more. The big takeaway I want you all to, to have from this is that by running these individual tests, it tells you something about the effectiveness of this tactic of showing new items or showing them recently viewed items. But the broader implication is actually it gives you evidence that should support or actually reject this initial theory that you had. So in this case, the fact that this test didn't work, it gives us one more piece of evidence that maybe novelty should not be our leading theory. And instead, if you only had resources now to run one additional test, what should you run your test on? I would say that this first round of testing gives you evidence that you should probably choose to do something, choose to run another hypothesis that has more to do with familiarity than it does with novelty. So that's kind of the first takeaway that I, I wanted to give here is that theory impacts product outcomes in multiple ways. The first way is that it actually really impacts what you consider testing. So that space of hypotheses that you're thinking in, and then also what you choose with limited resources to test. The other way, there are four here, but the second way in which theory impacts product outcomes is that it also affects how you set up your tests. So I'll give you an example, a very common problem and question that I see PMs uh, struggling with is, should you run a test of a single variable, like isolating that variable, or should you test multiple variables at once? So for this example, let's say that the outcome that we care about is that we want customers to use this merchandising coupon, right? So I don't know, we have an excess of pants and we just like want to sell through more pants on this particular month. Okay, here's a, a model or theory that of some of the input variables, like maybe the value of the coupon, you know, like 10% or 20%, maybe that affects use of the, the coupon. Uh, what about the message medium? So are we telling them about it through email or SMS, et cetera? Um, and then maybe the items that are eligible for this coupon will affect the usage of this coupon. So you kind of start at this position, but then as you dive into your data and you look into past results, you are looking at your qualitative data, you might actually come up with different weights for these inputs. So you might be looking at your data and you actually realize, oh, coupon value has this outsized impact actually, and it has a way bigger impact than these other input variables. Or you might have another case where you're looking at your data and you realize actually all three of these variables have an impact on the outcome and they're about the same, but each of their impacts are pretty small. If you have a very clear understanding of your underlying theory, it actually helps inform how you should test. So in this case, if you think that one variable has outsized impact and dominates kind of the effect of um, customers using the, the coupon, then I would say, you know, this should push you to testing this as a single variable. But if everything is kind of even, then it should probably push you to testing multiple variables, especially when we know that it's very hard to detect an effect on just a single variable that has like a small impact. It's hard, you know, for data reasons that we can get into. 
So um, one note here is that you can definitely have tests that succeed without a strong theory, for sure. Um, but I would say, you know, you can get lucky. Um, but if you want to consistently deliver results by understanding the process, uh, if you want to consistently deliver results, you really want to invest in understanding this underlying process that you're intervening on. Okay, so we talked about how theory impacts what you consider testing, how you test. Um, what about how you interpret results? So here's an example, again, from ThreadUp, where we want customers to purchase more items. And one theory that we were playing around with for a long time was maybe trendiness, right? If we highlight items that are very popular right now, um, that is what's going to lead customers to purchase more items. So we decided to set up a test. We're like, okay, one claim that you might derive from this idea of popularity or trendiness is if we show customers a carousel with items that are the most favorited items on ThreadUp, people should want to buy these items and it will get them to buy other items as well. So, you know, we picked items like this that have over 400 favorites or, or, um, or you know, 85 on, on this side, these cool pants that you could buy on ThreadUp. Um, okay, so that's our hypothesis. We'll show a carousel of these uh, favorited items. So here's a spoiler. It didn't work. <laughs> we got no results here. It didn't move the needle at all. And so when you have a test that fails, um, from a theory building perspective, you actually want to ask yourself two questions. So one, was this hypothesis a good test of this theory? And if you think that it's not a good test, then that would actually push you to testing another hypothesis in this general space, in this forest, shall, um, if you, you know, one way of saying it. And so, you know, maybe the carousel is a good idea, but just the placement wasn't right. Or maybe trendiness is the right thing, but we actually need to surface it in a different way through a sorting mechanism instead. But the other question that theory building forces you to think about is, does the failure of this test actually mean that we need to amend or refine or abandon our theory? So in other words, is trendiness actually a key input variable or should we revisit kind of this broader theoretical framework that we developed? And the reason I bring this up is that a very common pitfall that I see with product teams is that when you report on a test, you'll hear teams basically say, oh, this test moved outcome X by Y amount or, or it didn't. And from a theory building perspective, the deeper question you want to ask is why did we get the outcome that we see? And anytime you see the word why, your spidey senses should go up and say, okay, this is when you'll want to talk to your customers. So that's what we did. Um, we had this original theory that trendiness would affect customers purchasing more items. When we actually talked to customers, what we found is that the meaning of favoriting was actually very different than what we had initially intended. So you'll see this item has over 700 um, favorites, but you'll also notice that this price is a price that most people are never willing to pay for a purse. So these items that were getting a lot of favorites, the meaning of it actually was that people were looking to these items for inspiration. So it wasn't that it was going to lead them. They didn't have intent to purchase, but rather these were items that were inspiring to them. And that's actually why they were racking up a lot of favorites is that nobody was buying them, but they were all inspired. <laughs> and inspiration can have an indirect effect on the outcome that we really care about. But this sort of digging and actually understanding the why led us to abandon this um, area of product development and really go back to the drawing board and try to think what is the actual key input variable that we want to target in order to more directly um, increase customer purchasing. OK, so ways in which theory impacts outcome. The very last one that I want to talk about here is that it really has a strong impact on what you choose to test next or what you choose to do next. And essentially what we're talking about here is product strategy, right? So better theory makes for better overall product strategy. This is kind of the point that I've been building towards here. And I'll illustrate this by giving some example of common issues um, that product managers face. And hope, I think many of you will be familiar with as well. So one is that you run a bunch of tests and you just don't get any detectable effects. And then you end up pivoting too quickly or too often. There are ways to talk about this like, oh, is the hypothesis set up well, et cetera. To me, when I see this, one of the first things I think about is that it's often an indicator that, that there was a lack of initial theory building. So we don't have a strong theory and it means that we're testing in two small pieces or we're actually you know, flipping around tests um, too often because we don't have this consistent point of view. 
Another common example is um, you see teams that are testing a lot of disconnected things, but it doesn't lead to cumulative learning. And this can be really disempowering for your stakeholders. They don't understand like what the alignment is here. To me, again, this is oftentimes a reflection that there is no built-in process for theory building. So either there was a lack of an initial theory and or in the way that you actually analyze and interpret your tests, there's no way to build that back um, to say whether or not it affirm, confirms or denies this original theory that you had. The last common issue is, um, I think, one of the biggest ones, and it's when teams kind of get stuck in this place where they're always doing incremental testing due to a lack of conviction for making a better bet. And I think this is one of the most powerful ways in which theory can really impact product outcomes is that when you really invest in that initial theory, what you're doing is that you're building conviction by building evidence together that allows you to take these much bigger bets later on and also allows you to keep iterating in the same kind of product space, even if you have specific and individual tests that fail. So. How does theory impact outcomes? It impacts what you choose to test, how you set up these tests, how you interpret these results, and then ultimately your product strategy. And so pulling it all together, you know, great PMs are essentially great theory builders. They're great product and test strategists. They, and then they put themselves in a position where they have a higher likelihood of great product outcomes. Okay, the last section here is practices and tools for building generative theory. So there's uh, Kurt Lewin, some of you may have heard of him, probably not, but he's the one of the pioneers of modern social psychology and he has this great quotation that's, there's nothing more practical than a good theory. And I put this up here to kind of make fun of myself a little bit and to say, okay, Jen, you know, you've talked a lot about theory, but okay, how, how do we do this? Um, we only have a few minutes before I want to jump into the Q&A, and so I'm just going to give a few pointers on the nature of theory build, building and how to think about it, and then just a teaser of some tools and practices. But as a reminder, this is just the tip of the iceberg, and so I'm really excited to keep this discussion and this dialogue going. Okay, so on the nature of theory building, if you wanted to take one thing away about theory building is that it's ultimately this inductive process, right, that is fundamentally creative and also informed by data. So you're looking to your data and through a creative process, generating theory. So in terms of practices and tools, um, what this looks like is that we see a common pattern around uh, among people who are good theory builders, and it's this pattern. One, they engage and really immerse themselves in the data. Two is that they then synthesize and take a step back. And then three is that they create artifacts, they get feedback, they iterate. Okay, so what does that look like on a practical perspective? I'm gonna give you some examples, but the broader takeaway is that there are many ways to do each of these steps. It's a fundamentally creative process, so there's no one right answer, there are just a bunch of options. So tools for engaging and immersing in data, you wanna lean on your stakeholders here. I've just listed some examples of data um, and evidence, you know, qualitative data, previous A-B tests, market research, your own experiences, um, so on and so forth. So lean on your stakeholders here. And this is actually why collaboration from the beginning is so important, um, one of the reasons. What about synthesizing or taking a step back? You know, one of the best ways of doing this is you know, to just go for a walk. Um, so I say this, um, not even facetiously, I'm quite serious about going and taking a walk, but the broader takeaway is that you actually need to make that time to build synthesis into your product development process, both formally and informally in terms of how you schedule and think about the timing of product development as a, a series and sequence of, you know, cyclical actions, but also just you need that mental space and carving that out for yourself is one of the most important things that you can do as a product manager manager. Finally, creating artifacts, getting feedback, iterating. There are tons and tons of frameworks that you can use here. I've shown a bunch of causal diagrams today that are extremely simple. There are a lot more complicated ways to diagram these relationships. You can also use things like force field analyses, jobs to be done framework. You know, we're, we're product managers. We, we, we are good at our frameworks and there are many that you can choose from. But overall, I just really wanted to emphasize that, again, there's no one right answer. And I think the beauty of theory building and product as a craft overall is that we have all these ideas and frameworks, and then we uh, are in a position to contextualize them 
to the stage of our company, the stage of our product space, the problems that we're solving, the size of our team, the availability of resources, and so on. And so if there's anything that I want you to take away from this, is it's that anyone in your organization can participate in developing strong theories and building product strategy. It doesn't just have to come from the top. It doesn't just come from the bottom. It really is this, this activity when you think about product development as theory building is an activity that we can all contribute to and be empowered to think strategically about. So what did we cover today? What is theory? How does it impact product development? What are practices and tools for building generative theory? And ultimately, it just keeps coming back to this point that if you want to build great products, start by building great theory. This is just the beginning of this conversation. There's so much more we could go into in terms of specific tools, how to contextualize some of these ideas. Uh, I'd love to continue this conversation, which we will in a second in the Q&A, but also always happy to connect and keep discussing these ideas and others. Um, so my information and Joe's information is up here and we'll be really excited to connect with you all. And with that, that brings us to the Q&A. Thank you so much. And I'm really excited to hear all of your questions.